we gather to share in our love of God. Lord, open our hearts and let us share your good news. We gather to share our witness to God's goodness. Lord, let our lives bear witness through service to your people. We gather to praise God whose love is eternal. Lord, open our hearts today to sing your praises. How awesome God's light is. It pours rays of comfort and hope onto this dark world. Come, dance, rejoice in the light. Lord, let your light flood into our hearts and spirits. Come, let us celebrate. Let us bring our praise to God. Let all of us gathered here celebrate God's absolute love. Let us offer our lives in service to others. Give thanks to God. Proclaim God's goodness throughout all the world. Thanks be to God for the blessings which have been poured on us. Lord, enable us to use our gifts to serve you in your world. Amen. Amen. The announcements for the week are on the board, and they are the same as usual. Bible study on Wednesday, Justine and John's schedule, and I don't know of anything else. I guess the only other thing is keep your eyes open. We'll be making a decision early this week on what we're going to do for uh, Maundy Thursday and Resurrection Sunday, and I will get that out as soon as that decision is made. Uh, we'll get it out to you in an email, and then we'll post it next Sunday as well, and the next couple of Sundays. So uh, we haven't forgotten. We just as we're trying to give ourselves as much time to make as good a decision as is humanly possible. Thank you. Let us come to God in prayer. All seeing and all knowing God, in our richness we have believed that we are the ones who have all the answers to life's problems. 
But when those who have little offer all they have, we are put to shame. In our power, we believe that might is right. But when those who are powerless offer love and mercy, mercy, we are put to shame. Joy fills our lives when we center our lives on Jesus Christ. Hope fills our hearts when we focus on our Savior. Comfort fills our spirits when we believe in the Lord. Peace fills our soul when we seek to do God's work. Come, let us celebrate and praise our Lord in whose loving and powerful name we pray. Amen. We come now to our time of confession. You know, Christianity is about telling other people how to live. At least that's what we've made it in so many ways. I mean, we seem to miss the point of a speck of sawdust in others' eyes and ignoring the plank in our own. Worse yet, we've missed the core message of the gospel. We will put John 3.16 on a poster or a t-shirt, but do we really believe it? We don't act grateful to that God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. And even if God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, we're more than happy to be the ones who condemn. We certainly want to be saved from our sins and to be forgiven, but others just don't deserve it unless they're friends and family who think and act the way we think they should. As for sharing with the world the way to be forgiven and saved, well, that's for us to know and them to find out. They wouldn't listen anyway. The gift of salvation is for us good Christians. And so it doesn't matter if others are kept out of the loop. They wouldn't be good Christians like we are. They wouldn't go to our church if we told them the good news of Christ's sacrifice. So why bother? We forget that Jesus told us to share the good news of God's love. He didn't make the sacrifice of his life so that it might be kept secret. We are guilty of separating ourselves from both God and our neighbor when we're not willing to share the good news of salvation. Let us confess that we are selfish with the good news or we don't believe it. Let's confess that we don't care enough about our neighbor to want them to have the opportunity to spend eternity with God. We think that privilege should only be ours, and so we separate ourselves from God and our neighbor. Come, let us confess our sins. Join me in the prayer of confession. God of mercy and patience, forgive us when we get so caught up in the details of living and when we become so overwhelmed by our current woes that we neglect to help others. Enlighten us again with your spirit and your words of healing love. Caring and sharing are the hallmarks of discipleship with Jesus Christ. Heal and forgive us. Give us hearts for joyful caring and sharing. For it is in Jesus' name we offer this prayer. Amen. Amen. Let God's love and mercy wash over you as the spring rains wash over the earth, bringing promise of new life, life and hope. Be at peace. You are forgiven. Amen. Join me in the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us come to God in prayer. Almighty and merciful God, open our eyes. Help us to see what you have tried to make so clear and so plain, that you love us. You love us enough to die for us. We need to see that, but not just see it. We need to feel it. We need to not just hear it, but to know it at our very core. And then we need to share it. So Lord, help us. Help us to see how much you love us. Help us not to let 
things like this world to get in our way. Help us to look forward to the time that we will spend eternity with you, understanding that what's going on now will, will pass and it won't be all that long. But eternity is forever and we will spend that with you because of your great love and because of your willingness to sacrifice for us. And so, Lord, thank you for, for being with us here this day. You're always with us, but Lord, please help us to get in touch. Help us to stay tuned to you, your word, your workings. And may everything we do this day, may it, may it bring us closer into focus. And it may that occur every day. May we learn to focus clearly and, and sharply on you, your love, and what you have for us to do. So that's our prayer for the day. That's our prayer for every day. And all these things we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Israelites are on the last leg of their years long journey to the promised land. Kings of the lands along their route have, have denied them permission to travel through their countries. Some have even attacked the Israelites and taken some of them as prisoners. Aaron and Miriam, Moses' siblings, have died. And Moses has been told by God that he will continue leading his people to the promised land, but he won't be allowed to enter. So all of that good news brings us to our Old Testament reading today from Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. And I would ask that you listen closely to the gospel reading when John reads it, because there is a reference made by Jesus to this reading from Numbers. Reading from Numbers 4 through 9, verses uh, chapter 21. Then the people of Israel set out from Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient along the way, and they began to murmur against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness, they complained. There's nothing to eat here and nothing to drink, and we hate this wretched manna. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among them, and many of them were bitten and died. Then the people came to Moses and cried out, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and sinned against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord told him, Make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to the top of a pole. Those who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of bronze and attached it to the top of a pole. Whenever those who were bitten looked at the bronze snake, they recovered. The reading from the Psalms is Psalm 107 verses 1 through 3 and 17 through 22. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others he has saved you from your enemies. For he has gathered the exiles from many lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some were fools in their rebellion. They suffered for their sins. Their appetites were gone and death was near. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He spoke and they were healed, snatched from the door of death. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for all his wonderful deeds to them. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and sing joyfully about his glorious acts. Here in the readings. Thanks, Anne. Our reading from the gospel today is uh, one that we probably have all tripped over more than once. We certainly see it at football games and all kinds of things, at least a portion of it. But if we look at the chapter and we look at the entire scripture reading in John 3, we might just get a little closer and sharper perspective. And we might want to stop hearing John 3, 16 so often and begin to believe it and then share the good news it brings. But anyway, hear the word of the Lord from the gospel. 
Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews, and he came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And Jesus answered him, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after growing old? Can one enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Now don't be astonished at what I said to you. You must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. And so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. And yet you do not receive our testimony. If I had told you about earthly things and you don't believe how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one's ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have everlasting life. Indeed, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. May God grant understanding to this reading of God's holy word, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us come to God in prayer. Almighty and merciful God, you do love us, and in fact, you care for us greatly. You care for us enough to make sure that we can spend eternity with you. But you don't force it on us. You offer it. You paid the price of admission. But it's up to us to accept that gift. And it's up to us to share that gift with others, the fact that at least that it's available. We don't do that very often, Lord. So help us. I think we don't do it, Lord, because we don't really understand what it means, or at least stop to think about what the fact that you paid the ransom for us really does mean what it means to spend an eternity with you. Talk to us today, Lord. You've asked me to bring a message and, and hopefully the message will contain those things in it and be very clear, but it really can't be my message. It has to be yours. And so, Lord, use me as a conduit and, and use me as a clear conduit directly to the hearts of your children. Get me out of the way. Make me transparent to your cross. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be holy and acceptable in your sight, our rock and our belief, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as I read this, I, you know, I, I thought about, uh, the fact that we really believe, I mean, you know, it's all over the place, you know, God's love of the world, John 3, 16, but do we really believe it? Um, and what does it mean to believe that? So um, I, I began to take a look at myself and take a look at the world around us and say, you know, why do we believe, first of all, that it's so hard to come and ask God's, God questions? I mean, Nicodemus came at night uh, to ask Jesus questions and, and apparently didn't think that um, it was that he could do that during the day. And I guess he was putting himself at risk, but I think uh, we, we need to believe that it's okay to come to God with questions and, and not just in those quiet moments right before we go to bed. Maybe we should be asking God questions all day, every day about you know, what does he want us to do? What does God want us to do? What does God um, want us to see? How does God want us to behave? I mean, I think we've got to ask all, why 
Do we see the things that we see? Why are things going on in the world? We have to come to God with questions, and we believe it's hard to do that. Well, it's not. It shouldn't be, anyway. Um, why do we believe it's so hard to want more in-depth knowledge about, uh, about God? Why, why, do we th why do we think that, okay, whatever we get fed on a Sunday and we've been fed in Sunday school over the years, that's enough? Well, I don't know. God has so much more for us. And if we do, but as we do biblical study, as we talk to each other, as we do theology, we find how there's so much more that we can know about God and what God offers us and what God wants us to do. And why is it so hard? Or why do we believe it's so hard to do as God asks us to do? God said, look, I'll provide you the resources you need. I'll provide you the strength and courage. Just ask for it and then go do it. And I think a lot of times we, even if we, well, most of the time we don't ask for it, the, the strength and courage and the resources to do what God asks us to do. Um, but even when we do, um, we, we don't do it. <laughs> um, and and we, what we need to, I think one of the things we always need to ask for is the courage to do what God has called us to do. Why do we believe it's so hard to change? Um, God has said and been very clear throughout scripture, um, God will not tell us or force us to do anything. That would make us slaves. Um, but we are to look at what we're doing on a consistent basis and metanoia, turn back to God, change what we're doing. By definition, metanoia requires change. Why do we believe it's so hard to change? And why is it so hard for us to share the good news of God's love? Because we don't. I mean, that's what we're really called to do. That's what evangelism is. Evangelism, the base word is evangelium, which is, means to good news. And we're supposed to share the good news. We don't, we think evangelize is go knock on somebody's door and hand them a, a pamphlet um, and then force them to drop to their knees and pray a prayer for forgiveness. That's not what evangelism is. Evangelism is sharing the good news of God's love and then letting the Holy Spirit do its work. And I guess really the base question for me is why is it so hard to believe that God really loves us? Well, let's take a look at some of these, see if we can come up with some answers. Um, the story today really has five things that we need to believe. First of all, that people come to Christ in different ways at different times. Nicodemus comes in, in the middle of the night asking questions. Um, the disciples came to Christ when he called them from doing their daily work. Uh, people came to Christ when they needed him and they needed the miracles. People today still come to Christ in different ways. Um, it isn't all at a Billy Graham crusade or on a Sunday morning. People come to Christ at different ways in different times. And I would say to you that that's part of our issue, <laughs> that, that Christ needs to be um, part of our lives and, and we need to be available to people uh, when they're ready to come. Um, why? Another thing I think we need to believe is that we need to change. We need to change at our very core, not just in our, um, in, okay, I'm going to change for a day or I'm going to make this change, but, you know, if it comes, our problem comes back tomorrow, no big deal. Metanoia is about turning around and coming back to God. Um, and I think we need to believe who we are that who we are is evidenced by how we act. Um, I, I think that we forget that people look at us, particularly when we're Christians. And, and I always say, you know, if you're going to wear a cross, you better act like a Christian. Uh, if you're going to identify as a Christian, people look at us and they see how we act and, and then make judgment calls. And uh, about whether they want to be part of that, whether they want to take that name on or not. And so um, I think that we've got to pay attention to what we do and how we act and how we say what we say and what we say. And, and basically how we live our lives as Christians. And that, that then says, you know, Christianity is not a Sunday morning thing. Christianity is a way of life. Because, and it needs to be, because remember, there were small a apostles. We are small a ambassadors for Jesus, and uh, that people judge us by how we act. And matter of fact, they judge God by 
how we act. And I think the other thing we need to believe is that God loves us and Jesus loves us. And if you don't believe that, um, and I've talked to too many people over the years who claim to be Christian, who really don't buy into the fact that God loves love us um, and that Jesus loves us. And then they wonder why people around them don't want to go to church. Um, so I think we need to um, pay attention to that. Somebody said to me the other day, you know, with all the bad stuff that's going on in the world, how can I believe that God loves me? Um, and I think for a lot of folks, particularly during this COVID-19 crisis, but as we see things happen during the, during the week um, and people look at the bad stuff and go, you know, I'm not sure I believe that God loves me or anybody else for that matter. I believe God, and that's where we get this image of God or one of the places we get the image of God as a vindictive God, God as a, as a God who wants revenge, God who punishes. Um, I think we've got to look at the world through different eyes from a different perspective. You see, God loves us so much that God provided a way to live with God eternally. Not that God didn't make a promise that this life would be easy and kind, the promise God makes and then fulfills through the death, life and death of Jesus Christ is that we will live with God eternally. And there, I don't find anywhere in there a promise that life is going to be kind and easy and that, that things are going to be just go the way they are, uh, you know, the way we want them to be, not the way they're going to go the way they are, but go the way we want them to go. Um, we're not in charge. And, and God gives us choices and there's, there's consequences to all of our choices, some of them good consequences that we want, some of them consequences we don't want. And it's because God has given us the right to make decisions. Um, and I think sometimes we forget that that's, uh, that's a gift too. Uh, <laughs> sometimes a good gift, sometimes a not so good gift. But uh, you know, God says, no, I've given you a life. You are not a robot. I will give you the opportunity and I will stand back and let you live your life and make your decisions. Just understand there's a consequence to all, all decisions. But, and this is the big but, this is the good news. God says, no matter what you do, whatever decisions you make, as long as you continue to believe that I love you and you love me, you're welcome home anytime. And, and we, we look at people and we look at our children and I think the same way. Well, God, if we can look at our children that way, then, uh, then God certainly can. Let's take a look at some of this. People come to Christ in different ways. Nicodemus comes tonight at night and he does, either doesn't want to be seen and therefore judged, or he might have just wanted some uninterrupted time with Jesus. But at any rate, he comes to Jesus at, at night. And if Jesus had said, you know what, go away, it's too late, um, I don't care. Uh, that would have been something quite different than what happens. We would not have the good news of the gospel laid out so clearly and, and succinctly if Nicodemus uh, had been turned away and had not been allowed to ask his questions. Um, and not everybody comes to Jesus in public. I mean, um, people typically come to Jesus, uh, or we think they do, either a, uh, at a revival uh, Billy Graham is now gone, but there's still people out there doing revivals. And uh, in, in most Baptist churches, there's an altar call. Um, so you know, we, we think that people learn about Jesus and get inspired and the Holy Spirit moves them. They come to the altar and yeah, well, that happens, but that's not the only place it happens. I guess one of the, the, the sparks of joy I saw, uh, there's a, a job posted on LinkedIn um, for uh, pastors who will go and visit people um, and be kind of a chaplain for them in business um, and to, to you know, go and, and spend some time with folks and, and be, sadly enough, there are enough people in the business world that don't have churches or have pastors that we now need to provide them uh, but maybe that's not bad. Maybe without the denomination and all the other stuff that goes with that, maybe the opportunity of people to approach someone that they know is, is caring about them, who, who has spent some time um, doing some study. Um, I, I noticed, I, I know that during my career as a consultant, 
Um, I always said that my, my parish uh, wasn't necessarily a church. <laughs> my parish was, was the every office I walked into. And I was uh, surprised for at least initially at how many people would come to me when they knew that I was a pastor, who would come to me at a break, who would come to me um, before or after a class, and, and they'd ask, and they'd want someone to pray with them, and they'd want someone to pray for them. And they would ask questions about Christ uh, and about the church. And, and I really did spend as much time probably as a pastor uh, in my corporate world as I did as a pastor uh, in, in the ecclesiastical world. And it's one of the reasons, by the way, that I wear a collar is so that I'm available uh, when people have those kinds of questions. Yeah, people can come to, to Jesus from a variety of places. They come from books. They come certainly on the internet. Um, the problem with coming at coming to Jesus through books and the internet and those kinds of things is they're impersonal. There is no one there to walk the walk with them. And I think we've got to be aware of that. And one of the ways that God speaks to people is through other people. And that's always, that's always good news because then there's someone who can be personal with them to, who can, can care about them and people get the sense that God cares about them because there are people who do care about them in the journey. Um, can you believe that, you know, God might just send someone to you to find the answers. See, God speaks to people through other people. Can you believe it? It might be you. And are you prepared to answer the questions they bring? In other words, one of the things I think we've not done very well with as a church, and I say the church at large, is we've not helped people get ready to answer the questions that non-believers bring. The unchurched bring, the non-believers, the folks who are, who are out there really looking for God and can't seem to find God anywhere. They have questions. They ask the questions and we look at them and go, huh? And we, we don't prepare people to answer the questions uh, or, or <laughs> the other thing that happens is people dodge the questions. You got to be ready to answer them. And that's what I said to you. You got to have your elevator speech ready, but you also have to be knowledgeable enough and, and uh, comfortable enough with your own spirituality, your own faith that you can answer them. And by the way, if you're not, are you at least open enough and willing to walk with people who are asking you questions to which you do not have answers? In other words, are you willing to say, you know what? I don't know. Let, let's see if we can find this together. Let's, let's do this together. I, I find it interesting that, um, you know, certainly we'll address that and embrace that kind of approach when it comes to things like exercise and diet and things like that. I mean, you know, Peloton is making a fortune uh, by providing a mirror image uh, for someone to help them through and to walk with them uh, as they do the exercise. Well, I think we've got to be ready to be the Peloton of faith. We've got to be able to, to walk with people and help them and help them find the answers, but not just throw them out there by themselves, to really spend some time with them. You can only talk to talk about what you know and believe, and that is the truth. In other words, um, do you know what you believe about God? Do you? If I asked you, do you know what you believe about Jesus? Um, do you know what you believe about the Holy Spirit? And uh, do you know why you believe what you believe about God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit. And it's not because pastor said or, you know, years gone by, uh, somebody else told me or somebody, uh, you know, a pastor in the past has had told me that this was right. Um, and, um, <laughs> you know, that doesn't ring well when people are asking you questions. Why do you believe that? Well, so-and-so told me. No, nah, I think we got to know a little more than that. I think we have to have what, what I call a defensible theology, a theology that we have worked through, that we have gained from experience, from other resources, certainly from your pastors, certainly from your brothers and sisters in the church. But I think part of what you got to bring is 
defensible theology or in making a defensible theology has got to come from your experience of God. That's why I encourage people if they're, if they're struggling a little bit with this to, uh, to keep a journal of some sort uh, so they can go back and go, yeah, you know what? When I was in that situation, here's how God interacted with me. Here's how God helped me in the process. And so, um, I don't know. Uh, you got to you got to know why you believe what you believe. Otherwise, it sounds really hollow. See, that's called doing theology, N not just identifying and being clear about what you believe, but being clear about what you believe and allowing that to emerge and grow from your life experiences, from the input from other people. Uh, you got to do theology, and then you got to share theology when people show an interest in it. Otherwise, you end up, well, <laughs> kind of making it a mess. Um, I, I think so, I saw someplace that this was Einstein who originally said this, but I think it, my original contact with it was a guy by the name of Tom Peters, um, and he, he would make the statement pretty consistently that those who don't know what they're talking about take the simple and make it exceedingly complex, and those who do know what they're talking about take the complex and make it simple. And I think we've got to, certainly as people come to us uh, initially seeking Christ, seeking God, seeking meaning in their life, uh, seeking what God, how God interacts with them, we've got to be simple with it initially. Now, we can grow together into complexity, but don't start complexity. And, and I think sometimes we, we want to uh, make our theology sound so complex uh, that like we know something. And the reality of the situation is actually it's pretty simple. Uh, God, God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes um, might not perish. And I think we have to be careful we don't make it more complex than that. Um, at least to get people to accept the fact that God loves them. <laughs> One of the things that happened when I was uh, actually early, early, early in my, in my journey towards doing ministry, um, I attended a class and one of the, um, uh, one of the professors was a, a lady and our assignment was um, explain your theology to an eight-year-old. And she said, if you can't do that, if you lose the eight-year-old, and they really don't understand or they don't obviously don't get it. Your theology is too complex. And it's too complex because you're not clear with your theology. Try it. <laughs> it's an interesting exercise, but it will force you to get clear. It'll force you to boil your theology down to its very core, to the bones uh, and the structure. Uh, and when you can do that, by the way, once you've got your theology and you can explain it to an eight-year-old, continue to work on it, I suppose. But the reality of the situation is that's what you really need. Try it someday. It's uh, it's an interesting experience. You'll find how people respond, but you also find out how firm, how solid, how clear your theology is. I think another thing we got to pay attention to is if, if we're going to change who we are, we need to be reborn. And that's, that's Jesus's point to Nicodemus. Um, he said, you know, if you really... Uh, really want to become a disciple of Christ. If you really want to know God better, then you got to be reborn because it's going to require that you do some change. And and I guess that's a piece of your theology. See, do you believe that we need to be reborn? And I think you got to ask some questions of yourself. Like, what do you like about yourself? What don't you like? And what would you like to change? Um, those are all key questions. And, and the, I start with the, what do you like about yourself? Because um, I think too often we, we approach ourselves from the negative. And I think we got to take a look at ourselves every so often and say, you know what? There's some good here. <laughs> there are some things I like about me and I don't want to change this. Those will be the core from which I work, but they will be the foundation on which I will build the things that need to change. And um, I was watching this old house the other day and uh, they were they were tearing up a floor, beautiful floor, I thought anyway. Um, but they didn't, the, the folks who lived there didn't like the, like the floor. And so they had to, they had to cha change it. They had to tear it up. And the, the issue is here, 
you've got to, ch if you're going to change something, you've got to remove the old before you can do and build the new. Um, so what do you want to change? And, and understand folks that rebirth is hard work. Uh, you've got to work on yourself in order to really be reborn, to change the things that need changing. It's usually not a simple process. And you can't be something new without something dying. Um, I, I have fought this battle most of my professional career because I've, I've dealt with change in both uh, my, my economic and commercial side of me, uh, but also in the church side. And you know, I, you, you know that my, my doctoral dissertation was on dying churches. And um, it's not dying churches cease to exist. Dying churches need to take that which no longer works and get rid of it and replace it and grow and nurture and, and do what is needed to replace what was and no longer works with something it is and does work that has impact that brings people to God and to Christ. Now, there, there are certain things you never change your, your value system unless there's reason to, but you don't change uh, the core beliefs of the Christian religion. You don't change what you believe, you change the methodology. And, and I think that the church for so long has not been willing to do that. I think we as people for so long have not been willing to say to ourselves, what needs to change? Not the message, but the means. We can be consistent in our message. God is consistent. God is consistent in the message. Paul is consistent in his message. But he goes back over and over again. If you read the letters, he goes back to the churches and says, okay, this isn't working. We need to change the method, not the message. And you can't be something new uh, without having the old means die so that the new means have a place to be. Two things cannot occupy the same place at the same time. That means also with what we're doing as well. So, uh, you know, message doesn't change. Means do. Has to be reborn. We talk about water and spirit to be reborn by water is to be baptized and, and understand why we do that. We baptize to show the world that we think we've been reborn. We think we've been re reborn. In other words, we try and change and we're not ashamed of changing. And we say to the world, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to change. We're trying to metanoia. We're trying to turn and return to God. We think we're doing that. We do that when we're baptized. But to be reborn by the Spirit shows that we have been reborn, and it comes back, it comes out, and that is an act of God. It's not something we do. God changes us. We ask God to. We, I, we um, represent it to the rest of the world in our baptism by water, but being baptized by the Spirit really shows through in how we act and what we do and how we respond to God's word and what things are different now and, and more responsive to God than what used to be. And, and it is only God that does that. And again, that's why we have a, you know, we think evangelism, we've got to convert people. We've got to change them. No, you don't change them at all. God changes them. That's an act of God. You've got to give them the introduction to God and the opportunity for God for them to interact with God and find the path and let the Holy Spirit work with them. To be reborn by the Holy Spirit means that we have been reborn and that's not us as humans, that is God working in our lives and the lives of those around us. It, it, it is an act of God that causes us to act differently. That's the baptism by the Holy Spirit. And we hear people talk about that. And, um, you know, that, that's a big thing in some of the Pentecostal things, uh, religion. And I'm not saying they're, it's, it's bad or wrong. What I am saying is it's more than what we make it most of the time. Just because we can speak in tongues does not mean we've been baptized by the Holy Spirit. It may be an indicator or not. But the question is, how are you living differently now than you were before you think you were baptized by the Holy Spirit? Because if you were baptized by the Holy Spirit, if I'm baptized by the Holy Spirit, what I do is different and closer to what God wants me to do on a daily basis. What I do, 
not what I say. You got to believe that God changes us so that we can have a better life, by the way, now and forever. And, and that's a crucial belief. You know, God's changing me. Uh, the, the song from uh, For Heaven's Sake, but he's making us over. Nothing's the same since that house record came. Well, you know what? You got to believe that God's building you a better house, that God doesn't tear things down without rebuilding and giving us a chance to rebuild and to be participants in our own growth, our own rebuilding of our lives in a better way. And, and God changes us so we can have a better life, not just here, but forever. See, this isn't a one-time thing. God changes us and causes us to evolve and, and shows us how to change and gives us the strength and courage to change, not just so we have a better life today or tomorrow, but so that we have a better life from eternity and for eternity. Uh, I would argue that a, a eternity with God in heaven is better than an eternity in hell, however you want to define hell. Living with God, I, I believe truly, is, is a better thing, and God gives us a chance to do that. Uh, we can have that better life now and forever. No more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. Well, that doesn't sound too bad to me. See, who we are and what we believe is evidenced by how we act. And you know you're reborn by the way you act. In other words, you know that you're changed because you're acting differently and for different reasons and, you, and, and things that are closer to God. And you talk about new things and how, about how you changed. And you, if you have been blessed by the Holy Spirit, then you can talk about new things and how you've changed and, and been reborn. Um, and... All people want really is the proof in the changed actions, consistent over a period of time. In other words, changing today for a day is, and then it goes away tomorrow, it reverts to where it went, uh, where it was before. It's not repentance. It's not consistent change. It's not embracing the metanoia that God has called us to and embracing the gift that God has given us in both the opportunity and the resources to change. Changed actions have to be consistent over a period of time or they're not really changed. And all that's granted through, through, through grace. You see, grace is the gift of God. And it, it, if you want to know who God is, look at how God acts. And God acts and offers us forgiveness and opportunity and resources and love and caring through grace. God is a God of grace. Just look at him. Just look at how God looks at and responds to us. How God acts towards us. God gave his only begotten son. Not because we deserved it. You see, God is willing to give whatever it takes so that we might be able to live with God eternally. God is willing to offer us whatever it takes so that we might be able to go and live with God in the way that God intended for us to be. You got to believe that. See, if you don't believe that, then, then okay, you're more than welcome to come on Sunday morning, but know that you're missing the very essence of being a Christian. You got to believe that God is willing to do whatever it takes that we might be redeemed, that the world through Christ might be saved. And if God didn't do that, and Christ didn't come and suffer the way Christ suffered as a, as a throwaway. See, God did everything, including the sacrifice of God's own son. God was willing to do that for us. And I, I always say to people, look, if you had somebody who was willing to die for you, what would you think? Would you think they didn't care? Or would you think that they loved you dearly and deeply? See, that's the question. Do you believe that Jesus came and lived with us and died a terrible death on our behalf? Do you believe that? 
at your very core, in your very heart, with everything, with your heart and your soul and your mind. You got to love God that way, but you also got to believe that God loves us and that Jesus came and lived with us and died a terrible death on our behalf. You got to believe that with your very core. Otherwise, life's going to be real empty um, and Christianity becomes even more empty. See, if the fact that God gave his only son is not evidence of God's love, then I don't know what is. If God's willing to sacrifice his child, if Jesus is willing to come and be sacrificed in a very incredibly painful way, if that's not evidence of God's love, <laughs> I don't know what is. See, God loves you so much that he sent his only son that if you'll just believe in him, you will not die, but have everlasting life. You can throw away all the theology books, in my opinion. You can throw away all the theology books. You can throw away everything else. If you believe that, you are Christian to your very core, if you believe it in your very core. God so loves you. He sent his only son that if you believe in him, you will not die, but you will have everlasting life with God. So I guess the question is, will you believe and accept that love? And will you change into what God wants and intends for you to be? Because that's the logical next step. When you believe that God sent his son into the world, then the next logical step is to accept the love and the grace that that offers and to make the change that God wants you to be into what God wants you to be, what God intends, both here and in, in the life to come. You see, if you are willing to believe and accept the, and that love that God offers and change into what God intends for you to be, well, that's what God wants. God wants it because God loves you can you believe it? Let us come to God in prayer. And uh, we remember, as we come to God in prayer, remember Robin Dupree on the loss of her father, Earl, as she moves on for that. Uh, we pray for the city of Pine Bluff and the city of Little Rock, who had more murders yesterday, I believe. Um, we pray for Sarah Kate Ross and her newborn, Benjamin. He's still in the hospital uh, but he's getting better and growing. And so keep him in your prayers. Um, keep uh, the prayers that, that the pandemic might abate and that people might be able to return to personal interaction on a variety of ways. Um, I would ask for, for a couple of unspoken prayers uh, that uh, just kind of keep, know that there are people out there that need your prayers and that I believe your prayers make a difference. So please keep them on your, on your heart Pray for those that you don't know, but who are suffering in some form or another, or who need your protection and who need God's, or not your protection, needs God's protection. Pray for, for both of those things as unspoken or unidentified prayer, uh, prayer please. Um, certainly continue to pay, pray for the healthcare workers and the nurses. And, and you know, we continue to hear the stories of, of nurses who are just quitting because they can't take it anymore. They, they, they've been overwhelmed and overrun. Um, and there are those who are still out there, people who are out there on the front lines, still doing this, but still at risk, and, but who are incredibly tired and weary. Um, pray for our schools, pray for our churches, that we might be places where people feel comfortable in coming and uh, coming looking for answers and that we might be able to provide the answers that they're looking for. Come, let us, let us pray the prayer that, that God taught us so long ago, the, the Lord's Prayer. And we pray that all the things we've asked for here, Lord, that you will, you will pick up and, and take and, and do what you want and what you see appropriate with. We pray also a prayer of, uh, of joy that you have given us so many things and that you've given us the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. And so now we're going to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us so long ago, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We ask that you would continue to bring your offerings to the uh, to the church and drop them off or send them in by mail or whatever so that we can continue to, to reach out to people um, and uh, that we can continue to make a difference in people's lives. And I, I continue to hear from uh, places like Neighbor to Neighbor and, and uh, CASA. And I heard this week from, uh, because we had made a, a contribution, a significant contribution to Vera Lloyd, um, I heard from them to say thank you and that we had really uh, made an impact, but we also need to keep the doors open and the grass cut. Thank you, Bill. And uh, our children being touched in a real way. And thank you, Linda. And thank you to all who do ministries in so many ways. So continue to bring and send your call offerings into the church. Let us come to God in prayer. God of mercy and patience, be with us this day as we celebrate the incredible gift of love you've given us. Help us to remember that the gifts we give go to help many people in need, that it is our prayer and intent. Remind us again that our loves are meant, our lives rather, are meant to be gifts to others, gifts for healing, for hope, for comfort, for peace and love. We give our gifts we give ourselves to that end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I survey
time to go. Time to go out and uh, convince ourselves, first of all, if we're not, that God loves us, um, that we can talk with God anytime we want to. Time to get our theology together and to, to make sure we know and we understand and we can share it with an eight-year-old if we need to. And we can share it and be willing to share it with whoever needs it. Because right now the world does need to hear the good news of the gospel, that there are good things beyond this life. And that if we just accept the grace of God and what's been offered in the grace of God, um, that we can spend an eternity uh, with God in a very pleasant place, uh, a much more uh, loving and caring place than we have here. But we got to be convinced of it ourselves first and then go into the world and share it. That's what God asks us to do. And so now may the grace of God, which passes all understanding, be with you, fill your hearts, fill your minds with peace this day and forevermore. Amen.